Hi, this is Paul. I want to do a little bit of commenting on uh, Richard Rowland and Jonathan Peugeot's most recent video on universal history, extreme Ethiopia. I thought the whole conversation was great, but I had made a video a while ago on universal history, and I, you know, there's just so many things I like to talk about. Um, it's this is this is a really important subject because communities are created by their assumed universal history. And, and part of what happened in modernity is that in an, in, a, in an attempt, by virtue of all kinds of things that we talk about, there's sort of a modernistic concordism that grabbed understandings of history. And you, you see this in all sorts of things. You can't, you can't look at contemporary history. Uh, Tom Holland is really, in many ways, sort of just on the on the cusp of this thing, because on one hand, he wants to be, if you listen to The Rest is History, which is a podcast that I listen to nearly every episode of and enjoy almost all of their episodes of it, they're always, well, did it really happen? And when you ask that question, you step into modernity in a particular way. And I'm not saying that that isn't important, and those of you following my channel know I don't think modernity is just some vast mistake that we could somehow sidestep or now sort of put away. It's never going to be that way. But these videos about universal history are really vital because the truth is we don't... <laughs> human beings aren't modernistic robots. We... Modernistic concordism is important but that's not i think how we finally create communities interact with each other you've just got all of these layers of culture and interpretation that are necessary in order for us to actually function and this gets into all of the, the verveki stuff in terms of comedy combinatorial explosiveness one of the things that i do right now often is I listen to storytelling and what stories are these massive compression engines by which we can relay far more information than is absolutely relatable in any of our lifetimes in a very compact way in a meaningful way that is actually manipulable and productive in order for us to be able to go around the world and do what we do universal history is a big part of that now what I I'm very interested in in this conversation his hagiography because hagiography for those of you who don't know the word basically means sort of a fan <laughs> it's not exactly fan fiction but it's not far from it and well let's just let's just get into it and 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 we'll talk about where they go hello everybody I am back here with Richard Rowland yeah, one more episode of our Universal History series, which has been really bringing up so many positive comments. People are excited about it. So it's fun for us because we are so excited about Universal History that we're both surprised and overjoyed to see that people uh, are following us down this rabbit hole. And so today is going to be our last episode on Ethiopia. I know it's, we've been talking about Ethiopia a lot, but it, it is so relevant to the situation of kind of the, the beginning and the end joining together and all this kind of eschatological vision. And so today we're going to look at Ethiopian, several Ethiopian practices and how they kind of manifest the two aspects of, of Ethiopia. One, which is this idea of the container or the ark. And then the other aspect is the idea of the edge and the extreme and how all these kind of traditions come together to, uh, to manifest a very specific and particular a particular version of Orthodox Christianity. So Richard, I hope you're ready for this because I'm excited. And Pedro? I am, I'm also excited. And yes, I'm ready. I've been reading, I think I told you this. I've been, I've been working my way through like an 800 page Ethiopian, uh, the, their Synexarium, their hagiographical text. I haven't made it quite all the way through this week, but I've read, I've read just a lot of hagiography and it's also sort of bouncing around in my head so i'm i'm ready and and, and what's a, so what happens in modernity and the enlightenment is not only hagiography relics icons 
all of this, I can the the iconoclasm of the Reformation and of the Enlightenment goes beyond just obviously statuary, stained glass windows, um, paintings in churches. There is a spirit going through there, and it, in some ways, it's a refining spirit because it wants to. It, it seeks the truth, but it seeks a certain kind of truth, and just with with just about every other human effort we almost always overreach because there there is something to be said about there is something to be said about modernistic concordism physical concordism i'll I'll say it that way i said it that way in a tweet i had a little little tweet about this today there is something to be said about modernistic physical concordism that asks See, and, and this is the part of the problem. When we say what really happened, that's really what we want to say. Modernistic physical concordism. And that's important. It's important to try to figure out who shot JFK. It's important to try to figure out what happened in any given situation. Because what happened in the physical space is a part of the overall picture. But we can't appropriate that without all of the meaning that encircles it. And this is this is probably easiest illustrated in what we do with historical fiction. So Hamilton is coming to Sacramento, and I heard that the the cast is going to tour the Capitol and the Capitol staff is going to get to meet the cast. You know, in one of my videos recently, I talked about the fact that in some ways, celebrity celebrity are the new saints in the secular realm. They're the new gods in many ways. That's what we call it. We call them stars, and we got our lives by them. Now, there's always a debate about to what degree is Hamilton, and look at our language, Hamilton historically accurate. And some will say, oh, it's very historically accurate. And you say, no, wait a minute. Did they all appear on some stage and 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 sing and dance like we see them here? Well, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. Oh, well, what exactly are you saying? It, it's that the, you know, this is where we get into it. And it's all this other stuff because obviously the modernistic physical concordism isn't sufficient to relay the meaning of the events. And in fact, this is part of the reason history for so many people, they think it's just dry because they're just telling me events. And well, what is hagiography? Hagiography is in many ways the um, made-for-TV historical movie or the biopic or all of this stuff that we really love. Now, again, you'll have someone come along, yeah, but that biopic really isn't accurate according to... Well, neither is the documentary in some ways. And we don't like the nerd that comes on, that biopic isn't really accurate. In what ways is it inaccurate? Or does it, and this is exactly what directors and producers and artists, they try to convey something more than just the modernistic physical concordism that goes along with it. And that is what art does. But of course, you take liberties in art. And so then when you get to this hagiography and all of these stories, depending on what frame you're listening to, so the orthodox, well, these are going to be, and I love where they take this conversation, um, well, let's just let's just keep going in it because I'm not I'm only going to play the first part of the conversation for the most part, but it it was really quite excellent. All right, no. so and I'll, or let deeply you, confused. I'll let you throw the ball in there and and start the conversation and and uh, and we'll we'll go along on it. Yeah. So you you discovered I think you're probably the only person in the world that I know that has read uh, ex- like I know about the Nine Saints, but I've never heard of this more extensive kind of uh, hagiography, Ethiopian hagiography. Yeah, well, they have a, uh, in in the Orthodox Church, we call it the Synexarion. Um, and I think the word that they use from the Coptic tradition is the Synexarium, but it's the same same word, same thing, right? Which is basically just like the daily commemorations, the, the, the daily lives of the saints. 
Um, and so they have they have a book like that, uh, very much like we do, uh, maybe equivalent to like the the Western, like the Roman martyrology or something like that. Um, although I don't fully, I, I would just confess, like I don't fully understand how uh, how like that book, the, that set of liturgical books actually works in in the Latin tradition. So you know, please don't at me. Or actually at me and, and tell me why I'm wrong. But anyway. Now, now, of course, when you get into the history of the Protestant Reformation, the the clearing of the calendar of the saints was a very big deal. And the, of course, Wittenberg had a huge number of relics that, I mean, Luther just crashed the market of relics. Now, again, when you look at relics, when you look at these stories, sort of like the guy who says about the movie, let's say the movie The Mission, you know, oh, I, the mission wasn't really accurate to, okay, well, did you like the music? Because, of course, the mission is, it's the music and it's the actors and Hamilton is, of course, the actors and the dance. It's all of these things. And, and you know, what's amazing is that we, we sort of suspend disbelief when you go into a musical like Hamilton or if you watch The Mission or, you know, perhaps Eric Metaxas, his biography of Bonhoeffer, many people complain that the biography is sort of an evangelical hagiography of Bonhoeffer because it sort of turns Bonhoeffer from a neo-Orthodox uh, a neo-orthodox theologian into a contemporary American evangelical. Now, scholars can have a big debate about that, and that's absolutely okay. But it's helpful to understand hagiography for what it is. And in fact, we live off this and we do this and we, we do it politically. We need it. One of the things that I've been wanting to get more into my videos you know, i ran into the wwe um protecting their intellectual property on youtube pretty fiercely is wrestling pro wrestling well what is pro wrestling we got kayfabe and hitman heart and in in many ways pro wrestling is in the moment that it was it was very big now it's been in decline very quickly and there's all sorts of reasons for that and other things have sort of stepped into them but the marvel cinematic universe i mean all of this stuff is is deeply religious and it's the way star wars it's the way that people construct their world now part of what's true in our contemporary world is that on the on the the estuary conversation, I said, first I said the canvas, and then I said the stage, because I made the same point in a rather briefer form, or brief form in that conversation, is that part of what has happened with the explosion of technology, all the way from, you know, first you have an alphabet, and then you have writing, and if you, if you look at these technologies, and then the printing press, and of course, uh, recorded audio and recorded pictures and the combination of sound and audio and remember this stuff has this stuff has been coming at us culturally with enormous speed and it's just at the beginning of the 20th century that you get film and then talkies and you know we've been developing that all along and that's standing next to this modernistic physicalist concordism and and basically what we're trying to do is, is sort it out. And so if you listen to something like The Rest is History, you know, 10 Greatest Churches, it, this um, Dominic Sandbrook has his sister-in-law come in and talk about these churches in England. And, of course, everybody's mentioning cathedrals. She's just like, you know, no, no cathedrals, no cathedrals. And then it's the, what's going on under that is... Okay, well, what about the, what, what, what of the stories can we sort of validate and verify physically? But that's, that's, that's not what makes our heart sing. Well, why? Well, what's going on with us? And, and this goes far beyond, you know, conversations of, of church and what some of you would consider to be overtly religious. So, um, what I wanted to start with, the reason I'm talking about hagiography, um, 
other than the fact that it's just something I'm deeply interested in. And it's one of the main, let's say, source materials for legend. And I want to find out why he's deeply interested in it. Because that it, that in and of, of itself is interesting because hagiography has, has fallen on really hard times. Legendary history or universal history. Um, and uh, it's legendary history or universal history. Well, you know, again, when you listen to the word legend in this modernistic, physicalist, concordist culture, legend is quickly dismissed until it's a legend of a legend that we like, a legend that we watch, a legend that we live into, a legend that we interpret the world through. Oh, that, then it's okay, but certainly the most popular genre of literature in the Middle Ages. Um, last time we talked... And, and that point alone, and I've heard him make this point before, and I think it's a critical point. And the first time he made it, it was like, huh. Most popular genre of literature in the Middle Ages. What is the most... What are, what are the, what is the most popular... What are the most popular art forms around us? You know, the biggest blockbuster movies, the songs, the sound... You know, books, books have sort of fallen on hard times as movies are, are just instantly accessible and they're enormously spiritual because they come in through the film and they take you away with them. And you walk out of the theater in some ways feeling like you've been possessed. Now, The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill just put out a, uh, an episode on demons and, of course, that was getting into it and I haven't, these, you know, a little commentary on a little bit like this is sort of easy for me to put out. For me to really sort of piece together something that gets in Rise and Fall of Mars Hill, Spirit, all of this stuff. I mean, part of the reason I, I piece out these little pieces before some of the really big pieces is because you've got to lay the you've got to lay the groundwork. You've got to get the language out there. You've got to understand sort of where I'm going to go with it. Talking, we kind of ended on this note. Uh in our in our previous video that this uh about the the fact that the saints uphold the world now i believe it to be okay okay the saints uphold the world now remember i just did a three plus hour video on marriage equality and i know in case you haven't figured it out i've got a troll inside my consciousness congress and i knew full well when i put marriage equality into that title I was going to trigger a bunch of you, and I did it on purpose. Because it's language like that that we should pause over. And, okay, maybe I just triggered some of you with it, but work on that binary shibbolithic filter that you've got and try to not get so triggered and think, well, exactly, marriage equality, is that's exactly the perfect word to put in that because of and I, I kind of want to do a video on this question of equality because, you know, some people have pushed back and said, no, the the progressives have a value, an ideal that they're pushing for. They're pushing for quality and inclusion. And it sort of triggers the, the Peugeot here because, yeah, well, can you actually live that out in a limited world that is so completely unequal so how how in fact does that value fit and work and and jonathan's been probably the most articulate on that topic than anyone so again back to well i'll have him say it again about the the fact that the saints uphold the world now i believe that to be literally true and now of course with all my trigger with this word literally i just imagined all these little saints sort of like atlas holding up the globe <laughs> The point they made, and I, you know, I caught their little tweet where they had this little video clip in the tweet about it. After I made that video about ideals, in many ways, I heard this, and they're right because a saint. Now, now we've got the Protestant Catholic thing about saints again here, because one of the things that Luther wanted to do was emphasize that, you know, to be a Christian is to be a saint. Yeah, but some Christians are better than others. And and so now we're going to get, you know, with Luther and the Protestant Reformation and the Roman Catholic Church, we're getting into all of this equality and hierarchy stuff. 
that is that is just at the center of this. And you might say, yeah, the Protestant Reformation. No. Jesus, if you read the Gospels, Jesus plays with these ideas all the time. You'll have, you know, no master among you. You have one master and one Lord. And all of you are brothers. It's radical. Egalitarianism. And Jesus brings that radical vision into the world. And that has been remaking the world. But then he also, you know, does the hierarchy thing. And and so it's right there. Look at it. It's a cross. <laughs> you know, symbolism. It's right there. So, well, let's hear him say this again, because it's a really important line. It's probably the most important line of the video, which is why they put it on Twitter. Um, I'll put uh in our in our previous video that this uh about the the fact that the saints uphold the world now i believe that to be literally true um like you know i do believe that there are people right now in this world praying for us that are that are holding back the judgment of god that are um you know and and, and that see and and what's so delightful about this is of course during luther's time they there was this broad I've, I've read it in previous videos you know there's this broad belief that certain months in a certain monastery are holding back the judgment of god and the time is being delayed and now when i say this in a post-cartesian world i trigger a whole your these patterns and these imaginations are just simply flooded and it's for this reason that peugeot kept saying you know we couldn't talk about this before but after Jordan Peterson, the times have changed. There's a, there's a little crack in modernity that we can begin to exploit. And, and a big part of what I've been doing in my channel is getting my fingers in that crack and, you know, pulling it apart and saying, now, now we're not going to get rid of modernity, but you got to, you got to see behind it and we're going to have to see through it. Uh, that metaphor doesn't really work, but saints uphold the world. And he's about to illustrate what he means. You know whose prayers we're we're joining, we're participating in. Um, okay, so so those of you that are allergic to, and, and I'm going to use this completely modernistic word now, the supernatural. That is not an old word. Those of you who uh, who just got triggered by what he ah oh, prayers, blah blah blah. You know Sam Harris prayer. Blah, blah. Lay this prayer thing aside, and 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 pay attention to the rest of what he's going to say. In, especially in the, in the liturgy but i also think that this this saying the saints uphold the world provides a very important interpretive key or symbolic key for understanding the way that a given principality manifests itself so something we talked about i think it was last time is is this idea that the way that the thing the thing that sort of symbolically ties stuff together is always going to be a person Um, it's like you've got everything in the cosmos sort of moving towards personhood and you have uh, and, and you have so you have the way that a the way that a, a principality manifests itself that it's going to be most strongly tied together is going to be in in a person usually in some kind of a a cult uh, a cultus of veneration and I don't mean like guys with dark hoods around pentagrams like cult in the like the anthropological sense people. Now, what he just did there is really tricky because we say it's going to be manifest in a person. So on one hand, there's a layer of that, which is it's going to be instantiated in a human being that's enfleshed. But he actually loops it through again. It's sort of like sewing. He loops it through again and says it's actually going to be instantiated in a in a person which is sort of beyond the enfleshed person. And that's where you begin to get hagiography. Because in a sense, the in a sense the person is instantiated in the story in a way that he can't he or she can't quite be instantiated in the person. But there's sort of a duel back and forth there because the story can't fully encapsulate the person, but the story accentuates and magnifies an aspect of the person and that's exactly what all biopics 
all these things that we love to do today, that's what all, all of they do and all of them do. And that's why, again, people will rush in and say, well, historically, and again, what they mean is modernist physical concordism. Every, all the little molecules at a certain point all plotted out in a little axis. And, and the artist will say, I bend that in order to not only have this principality, this spirit, this come through, be instantiated in the person, and then via the story that, that is lifted out of the person into the hagiography, into the legend, into the story. And in that way, the principality can be seen and the principality can go viral. And, and we put that in film, we put that in song, we put that in literature, we put it in story. That's what's happening. It's, it's sort of a, a looping through. Okay, this, let's have them say this stuff again. Well, of a, a cult uh, uh, in the cosmos of together he manifests itself he, the same you know and and that you know whose prayers we're we're joining we're participating in um in, especially in the in the liturgy but i also think that this this saying the saints uphold the world provides a very important interpretive key or symbolic key for understanding the way that a given principality manifests itself so something we talked about i think it was last time is is this idea that the way that the thing the thing that sort of symbolically ties stuff together is always going to be a person um it's like you've got everything in See, the now again when he says person in the modernist frame you think well someone with skin on him is santa claus a person is uncle sam a person is iron man a person well yeah but there yeah okay i i, I completely understand the distinction but Uncle Sam and Iron Man and Santa Claus function within our collective imaginary in a way that St. Nicholas, um, FDR, you see, even FDR, I mean, someone like that, they function in the imaginary in a way that their physical being could not function. Because of the, the physicality and the limitations of physicality. And so then we use film, photography, uh, uh, paintings, sculpture, song, legend, story to magnify that person and create, magnify that human being and create a person that is beyond. Cosmos step together. Is, is this idea that the way that the thing, the thing that sort of symbolically ties stuff together is always going to be a person. Um, it's like you've got everything in the cosmos sort of moving towards personhood. And you have, uh, and, and you have, so you have the way that a, the way that a, a principality manifests itself, that it's going to be most strongly tied together is going to be in, in a person, usually in some kind of a, a cult, uh, a cultus of veneration, and I don't mean like guys with dark hoods around pentagrams, like cult in the like the anthropological sense. People, so you know the 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 phrase "never meet your heroes." This is exactly why. Now, again, my friend Warren Mills over in Australia. Um, what's so good about the Golden Rule? That was the second book he wrote. The first book he wrote was about. Big Daddy Don Garlitz, who was a pioneer in drag racing. And young Warren Mills, born just after the Second World War, Australia was really sore at the Brits for, you know, taking their army to North Africa and leaving them vulnerable to the Japanese. And, and they were very, um, very grateful to the Americans who came and protected Australia and helped Australia. And so in many ways, Australian culture has sort of followed um, American Californian culture and 
young Warren Mills enjoyed cars. He eventually built his own car. He worked in the automotive industry. But Big Daddy Don Garlitz, he'd get these hot rod magazines, and he would follow all of that. And eventually he got the chance to go to America and meet Don Garlitz. <laughs> he can, when, if Warren ever gets his book published, he can tell you the story. But it's a story that all of us would would very much recognize. So there's there's the Don, you know, and, and again, we have all this language to deal with this. We have the Don Garlitz of history, we like to say. And you'll see this all the time if like PBS does a thing about, well, there's the Jesus of history and the Jesus of faith. And 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 in, in sort of our modernist snobbishness, we sort of sneer at the Jesus of faith and say, well, well, that's nice for children and old ladies and for those moments when somehow we're moved by music and wish to sort of elevate ourselves. But Eugene Peterson, who passed away recently, you know, used to write in his books about the sneer that he'd have when, you know, some, he was preaching in a mainline church and some some young chief executive full of himself would walk out of the church and say, oh, pastor, that was a lovely speech, but we really need to get out to the real world. And of course, that just drove Eugene Peterson nuts. He said, no, what's going on in this room is the real world. And and therein lies the fight, doesn't it? Um, where, where cultus, you know, which is a Latin word that means, you know, worship or veneration, um, it's that's the that's the root of our word culture right so the way that you have a culture is that you have you have a culture of, of veneration around a, a common point and the common point is usually a person yeah and There's that's really a- important because we we have a kind of neo we have a kind of platonic under you know strata in our understanding and we tend to think of ideas or these abstract principles as being the thing which binds us together uh but in reality in terms of human human reality Things are actually bound together by people, you know. Yeah. Now, when Jordan Peterson uses the word archetype, he's sort of doing the same thing here because archetupos, that's an archetype, um, is a head. It's a leader. It's the first one. It's the first type. It's the first example. It's the first thing. But when Peterson uses archetype, notice how often he'll use a person or a story or a drama or something like that. But the word is tricky. It, it's sort of like the way Peugeot uses the word pattern. And it, it's it's sort of like a pry bar in the cracks of modernity because pattern is a word that in modernity, well, there's no, no, no religion here. It's just a pattern. Oh, but once he gets that pry bar in and starts working at that crack, all this stuff is going to flake off. And archetype is basically doing the same thing. It's we're, we're 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 basically using modernity and some of this abstraction against itself. Yes, remembering and celebrating our common ancestors, our heroes, our p- politicians, our saints. This is actually the manner in which we recognize unity, much more than you know the idea of liberty or freedom or this these kind of revolutionary abstract ideal ideals we we remember napoleon and you know the french remember napoleon and unite themselves under napoleon much more than you know fraternity equality you know and and freedom whatever in in english you say it however you say it yeah and now what he said just there is super important because if you watch i've been watching what has been happening in language in the last 40 years And it's sort of the secular process by which we take, you got to take Jesus out. You got to take prayer out. You got to take, you got to take all of these things that are part of normal life. And you're going to talk about exactly what Peugeot, we're not going to talk about Napoleon. We're going to talk about liberty, equality, fraternity. We're going to abstract them and look at the main line. Now, Another video I want to do some commentary on is a really interesting one by by Sean McDowell, 
a conversation with a sociologist of religion who, who basically is making the argument that progressive Christianity and conservative Christianity are two different religions. And he goes into some of the dynamics, and this is very much along the line of a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about in my channel. I think we've gone a little deeper than he went into into that conversation. So I'm, I'm really motivated to do a, a commentary on that. But, but what has tended to happen in the in the mainline church is that they've wanted to, again, abstract ideals out so that, well, now suddenly we can somehow avoid all of the, all of the naughty physical, because, okay, on one hand, we're all skeptical about the, the, the modernist physical concordism. And so we're always reducing, we're sort of pouring that acid onto the le legends and fables and hagiography to try and get at the real Peter or the real Paul or the historical Jesus, all that. We, we keep doing that. But then underneath those stories are crunchy people that when we pour the acid on, it's like, yeah, there really is somebody under there. And then you have claims about Jesus, but then you have... Those are going to run into claims that are made in Islam and Judaism and and Buddhism. And 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 so you get down to that crunchy level, is of course where C.S. Lewis pulls out his trilemma. But you're going to pour the acid and you're going to get down to that crunchy level, and there's still going to be things that conflict. Because you've just said, okay, it's the modernistic, physicalistic concordism that matters. That's the real world. And, and you apply your acid and you dissolve all the legend and all this away. And there's still conflicts. And so the way you deal with that conflicts is you, you completely abstract. Well, Jesus was about self-donating love. And so we're going to, Jesus is now only an example of self-donating love. And, and what you've done is this whole process that, that, that Richard Rowland was talking about here, You've cleared it away, but now you're trying to do it on self-donating love. And so now you've got, and and of course with equality, well, anybody can be an example of self-donating love. And you might say, well, let's say, I don't know, um, let's say Gandhi and Churchill and compare them. A number of years ago, I read a very interesting dual biography of Gandhi and Churchill. It was really quite fascinating. And again, a lot of people in, from certain places in our cultural landscape will say, well, well, Gandhi is much more an example of self-donating love than Churchill. Oh, okay. But then you're going to find someone with a story where Churchill did something really dramatic for someone, and you'll find elements of Gandhi's story where, well, he sleeps between his two naked nieces and talk about, you know, senior pastor of some big box church somewhere. Well, I'm sleeping between the, my two naked nieces in order to, you know, bolster my fidelity to my wife. Yeah, that one's going to sell. Um, so, so the problem with this move of, of pouring the acid on and, and abstracting it all up here, and then now, well, I'm just finding examples of the abstraction. In all of those cases, you're going to find conflicting examples. And, and so what the hagiography does is sort of preempt that. Now, again, what happened in the Protestant Reformation, what happened in modernity was to address corruption that inevitably comes into human systems. And so we got to, you know, we're, we're, we're going to clean out the relic closet and throw away some of the worst stuff. Oh, what about that crown that was in Notre Dame? Well, well, you know, do we do we really think that was the crown of thorns that was on Jesus' head? Or has over time the everything that has accrued around that crown in terms of the culture layer and the emotional layer now given that crown value even though even if we have a degree of skepticism about the modernistic physicalistic concordism of the molecules in whatever they have encased 
in the vaults of Notre Dame. So th this is the stuff we're dealing with here. And again, some of you might be scoffing. Ah, you religious people. Oh, no, it's going to get a little closer to home than that. And, and to talk about that period for a, a moment, you know, because you had the American Revolution, the French Revolution, all happening right there kind of at the same time. And one of the things that they would do, especially in the iconography of that time and, you know, over the, say, the course of maybe the next 50 years, as they start building buildings and painting murals and things like this, is that they do really try to, to uh, depict the, like the, let's say the genius of a particular country, you know, uh, liberty, equality, fraternity, or, or, uh, uh, victory was a really important one um, at that period. Uh, and then, you know, like Columbia as this, you know, in the new world, like Columbia as the, uh, as like the goddess of the new world. Mm. And there's a lot of art, especially like, you know, if you go to like the United States Capitol building or some of our other, um, uh, is the shrines. closest thing? Yeah, shrines. Yeah, <laughs> I was trying to think of a word that wasn't that, but that's the right word. <laughs> Um, if you go there, you'll see you'll see these figures depicted, you know, these female figures often like nude or semi nude, you know, depicted in the same way as as Greco Roman uh, uh, Greco Roman gods. And the interesting thing is that um, this was this was a conscious attempt to tie back to Greco Roman civilization and personify these things, these abstract ideas as gods and goddesses. And the interesting thing is that it did not work. Yeah. Nobody in the popular imagination, like in the popular imagination, if you said, what's the person? Now, when he was talking about this, I thought, so when I was a kid, one of my hobbies as a kid was coin collecting. And of course, I was a kid, I didn't have any money, so I didn't have anything that was worth, you know, I'd go through rolls of quarters and dimes and nickels and pennies and look for wheat cents. And even by the late 60s, early 70s, I couldn't find it was hard to find silver quarters and, you know, I was doing all of that. But every now and then I'd scrape my pennies together and then you would get a peace dollar or a Morgan dollar or, or a, um, a mercury dime. And you begin to just recognize that in the early part of the 20th century and in the late part of the 19th century and, you know, all of American coinage up until the really the middle the post-war years what he's talking about is exactly what we did and then who went on them instead president's faces why personification of america most people who instantly go to george washington yeah you know like most most people most of the time and i'm not trying to make like it's it's stupid that you know like like there's a whole political thing right now about whether or not that's a good thing but i'm not trying to make a statement about that i'm just saying like most people most of the time if i show you george washington's picture picture on a one dollar bill like that's that's the most that's the most uh immediately recognizable icon so the interesting thing is that and and again we've seen this well we need to get a woman on the money we used to have a lot of women on our money no no we need a historical woman on our money oh we haven't had a historical president, oh. but we've got Alexander Hamilton on our money. Oh, and why is Washington on the dollar on the single and Lincoln's on the five? And why is Lincoln on the penny and George on the quarter? And, and we don't think about these things. We just, we're just acting as if. Is that we tried to create these symbols artificially and that did not work yeah the but exception what, i would say lady liberty like the statue of liberty because it's so big yes i think yes. that that think it does right. it was able to kind of imprint yes. itself on on yeah. the imagination and act as a almost like a like a kind of goddess figure for yes. for america that's yeah. a and size does matter then doesn't it and and then you think about that enormous statue in russia after the second world war and but then you think of well why did they build huge what what did they do in the temples you think of the 
Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., which is basically a copy of the Temple of Zeus. You look at the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. Now, of course, the, the, the Washington Memorial is a huge obelisk, but you know, you've, you'll find these women at the top of shrines in Washington, D.C., all over the place. They're women. Well, women, glass ceiling. Well, why, why, did they, why did they choose women to depict America and not a man? And, of course, you sit down with people, and if you've got enough little troll in you like I do, and you ask an inconvenient question, and... You know, they, they, they look at you like you just, you know, hit them with a hit them with an electronic flash in a dark room. They just uh, 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 well, 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 there's code running deep inside of us that we're not paying any attention to. As close as you get, yeah. but it no, is it is not the it's not the rule. It really is the only one. All the other right. figures are, are people. Right. It's the exception that proves the rule. If I showed most people uh, like a, a picture of the, the goddess Victory, you know, Nike, you know, and was like, who's this? People don't know, even though she's on the, 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 the ceiling of the rotunda at the U.S. Capitol building. So um, so this is so this this is all to say. Uh, if you're in Washington, D.C., visit the National Cathedral. Just look around. What do you see? Why is that there? What's going on? Um, the symbolism of a nation with a symbol being understood as something that holds two realities together rests most fully in its saints. Yeah. And uh, that includes those nations which are... Don't we have St. Patrick's Day? Big time in New York and Chicago? I mean, we borrowed a saint. Not overtly understood as something that holds two realities together. Rest... And just pause there and you have to ask it well what two realities does it hold together and so remember the stitching it needs to be instantiated in a person and but but we take that person and then we take it out of that person and then we we do this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth we're basically stitching the realities these the, the two worlds mythology we're stitching these two worlds together we're holding it together by these saints. Best, most full. And, and, and so for so some of you are going to say, well, okay, but why do we need the historical people? Iron Man. How historical is Iron Man? Well, then suddenly somebody's going to go back to the source material and say, well, well, Stan Lee developed Iron Man in 1950 or 60 or 70 something. I don't know. And uh, yada, 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 yada. in its saints yeah and uh that includes those nations which are not overtly christian like the united states uh for instance but which still have what amounts uh, what amounts to a cult of veneration and a hagiogra uh, hagiographical tradition and i'm just going to say a, a quick thing again about like uh, abraham lincoln because that got a, a lot of people very excited or very salty last time uh anybody know what day Abraham Lincoln died on, and I don't mean the date. Abraham Lincoln died, was assassinated on Good Friday. Sim symbol much? Uh, it's funny because I saw you know the clip, and I'm sure you're too seasoned of a YouTuber to go and like read the comments on your own videos. But I, I went down and looked at the comments on the clip of the stuff that we were saying about Lincoln. And one guy was like, oh, typical Americans. You know, they're, they're, they're only focused on, you know, what happens in their own country. And I was like, dude, this is from a video about Ethiopia. Like, come on, come on. <laughs> Peugeot's Canadian, come on. But anyway, um, but, but uh, the, I just want to, I just want to like, I, I want to give an easy example since most of our viewers. He's French Canadian. He's a hyphen guy are Americans so that we can understand that actually we do this and then we'll go and we'll talk about Ethiopia. Yeah. So uh, so this is going to this this idea of a cult of veneration, um, a hagiographical tradition. This includes both biography, but it also includes legendary material. Right. Yeah. George Washington chopping down his father's <laughs> cherry tree 
or the legend of Honest Abe are yeah. just as important, maybe more so than anything either of those men did, which is historically verifiable. Uh, See, let's, what's historically verifiable? What do we mean by that? Modernistic, because that's the, that's the big culture frame. Physicalist, did George Washington cut down his father's cherry tree? Well, you're imagining that there is a cherry tree that is referenced to in the story. There is an, an, an axe, which is referenced to in the story. And George Washington was at this place, at this time, at this age, located... XYZ axis in time, boom, this happened. That's what we are paying attention to. Now, again, that is not incidental. And this, again, is why I keep going back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is not incidental. Once you pour all that acid and, you know, just kind of water down the legend a little bit, you'd say there's something crunchy on there. But again, what we're doing is we're stitching this together and it goes in and out of person, which is quite frankly the way we live. Because again, I mean, John Verveke will tell you, you weren't born able to you weren't bo you weren't born able to imaginatively operate yourself as a person the way you do now in the world. I'm sitting here, I've got a name, I've got an identity. I not only have an identity completely apart from YouTube land, but now I've got an identity on YouTube. I have an identity that I have created within you of me, which is a little bit right and a little bit wrong. It's way too flat. Um, there, there's whole hosts of things to this. I remember combinatorial explosion. There's way too much here. But... We, we've got all of this that is far beyond just, you know, this physical stuff that's, well, this is you. Well, this is part of me. There's another me that that is being stitched together by all of this stuff. Um, that's super important to understand yeah. because it participates not only in the identity of George Washington, but like you said, that legend as its frame becomes a kind of a frame for how Americans perceive themselves. Right, right. We're honest. We're forthright. We yeah. sort of, you know, uh, the, the the way that... And, and notice what he's doing. He's, he's grabbing abstractions. But again, the point is that these abstractions get sewn together onto the person. We want to think about ourselves. Whether or not we live up to this. Yeah. Right. The way that we want to think about ourselves is that we're honest, we're forth. There's our ideals. And again, see, ideals isn't going away. Ideals, and, and I think this is a fundamental part, problem with the stuff we're trying to work out together is we have, we have completely lost the idea of what an ideal is and what it's for. Because an ideal is something we always fail. And it is for something that we aspire to, even knowing we will fail it. And the, you have to have a degree of comfort and acceptance that I will never hit these ideals. And, and when you have a culture that decides we're going to play, so, so, so we're so afraid of fable, but then we, then we have all these other lies that we pour on, on ourselves and we imagine... Well, I'm the best YouTuber on YouTube. Well, don't tell me I'm not. Don't tell me that Peugeot is a better YouTuber than me. Well, Peugeot has more subs. Well, Peugeot, Peugeot has more subs because he's a sellout. Because, because I'm so good at YouTubing, anybody who watches my channel is, is the real deal. And only sellouts watch Peugeot. Peugeot. Or, and I can make a whole long line of post hoc reasons why... I'm a better YouTuber than Peugeot. It, it, it's a stupid game. Because, well, there's an ideal YouTuber. But but that ideal then gets all the way down into ideal YouTuber for for what? For what kinds of videos? And for, you know, on and on and on and on. So you know, these hierarchies develop. But th this issue with ideals that we have culturally is a is a huge problem. And and what it what it represents is sort of this. So what I sometimes call, well, I'll call him an identity burn victim. One of the things that has crept into pastoral ministry is that the good pastor is constantly mirroring and affirming the person that they are talking to. 
Don't you dare tell me anything I don't want to hear. All right, well, given that culture now, pastors have learned, got to be really careful because people are really fragile. I mean, and the irony of the whole fragility thing is that the most fragile people are the ones out there calling fragility on others. And that's often the way this goes. But for someone to say, hey, Vander Clay, your channel's kind of weird. You ramble too much. You're, you're not terribly disciplined with your words. You waste a lot of my time. Um, you, you go to around way too many rabbit trails. You know, there's a reason Peugeot has way more subs than you. He's, he's a lot better at this than you are. He, he gets to the point and, you know, you know, then there'd be other things. Well, well, Peugeot is, is much clearer on a whole bunch of these issues and he's much more in alignment with me and, oh, does he mirror much? So, I mean, this is the way it goes, but, but you have to, if you're going to be a, a mature adult, be able to sit there and have people tell you exactly what's wrong with you and be right some of the time and not crumple up and, oh, I thought I was the best YouTuber ever. It's a big issue in our culture right now. And, and, and it, part of it comes from not understanding what an ideal is and what an ideal is for. Right, we sort of do the right thing no matter what the cost is, right? Um, so when Lincoln died, his body was moved, or you could say his relics were translated um, across the country uh, to be... It's also important to notice that part of the technological advancement of the Civil War was embalming. And so that then, of course, got applied to Lincoln. To be buried... Um, so when Lincoln died, his body was moved, or you could say his relics were translated um, across the country uh, to be to be buried, I think, in Springfield. Um, and uh, there was at every stop along the way there, people came on pilgrimage to see and to venerate his his body. This is a very religious thing. Mm. When his body reached, um, uh, you know, the 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 there there in uh now where he's buried in illinois i think it's illinois um i i've actually been there a couple of times but i was i was pretty young so my family went well before we get there i mean and this whole point about okay we we all had participation we saw participation trophies go through little league soccer and well now any anybody deserves to be anybody deserves to be to lie in state under the rotunda when anybody dies, we should put the flags at half mast. That's where this is going, right? Because once you say some people get to lie in state in the rotunda and most of us don't, well, now we've got a hierarchy. Well, are, are you saying that, that that senator or congressman or president is worth more than me? Now we're dealing with American egalitarianism. And and now we could say, okay, everybody in the country gets to lie in state. And then you would have, you know, two or three seconds where you would, you know, bring, you'd have this huge line out the door and you'd have all the caskets out the door and you'd have all the families queued up. And then what would we do? You'd get right onto the rotunda and then you'd have your picture taken. And in that picture taken, it would be, it would be captured for a moment. Then you would go home and say, this was where... This was where dad lay in state in the rotunda of the Capitol in Washington, D.C. <sighs> Except that trick's not going to work because everybody did it. And when everyone's special, no one's special. Remember the Incredibles? So all of this is going on. And, and this, again, is why Peugeot, he's the... Um, He's the apostle of purpose. He says, this isn't arbitrary. This is all purposeful. Went on essentially a pilgrimage to the tomb of Amos, Illinois. I think it's Illinois. Um, I, I've actually been there a couple of times, but I was, I was pretty young. So my family went on essentially a pilgrimage to the tomb of Abraham Lincoln. My dad it, it was really into Lincoln. Uh, when I was a kid, I read this massive multi-volume biography of Lincoln's life. Um, and that was one of the things that was, you know, like I was encouraged to read as a the dude likes to read a young person. 
Um, and and like, you know, I want to make it clear, like I'm not really down on Lincoln or, you know, I, and a, a certain part of me, like, I don't feel like this is necessarily like a huge problem. This is just the way that this is the way that America is. Like, if you want, you got to understand, like, this is part of our, our identity. Um, but so this is, you'll just get a kick out of this. Okay. Um, so there at, at, uh, at Lincoln's tomb, there's a large uh, copper, as in the penny, bust. So I don't, I'm, I'm just assuming, you know, things about American money. So Lincoln yeah. is on, the Lincoln is on our, our penny, our yeah. one cent piece. C- Canada has the loon. What, what, what's with you? You got the queen, but the loon? Oh, oh, why'd you put that bird on your money? Right, he's on our penny. Um, uh, we have dead, dead presidents on all of our money. Lincoln's on the penny, and he's on the $5 bill. And, um, and so there's a, a, a massive copper bust made of Lincoln's head. And the whole thing is tarnished, except for the nose. And the nose is bright and shiny. Why? Because people we, rub it. Because as you enter the tomb of Lincoln, you are supposed to reach up and rub the nose. Wow. For good luck. Yeah, it reminds me of that statue of St. Peter at the Vatican. There's yeah. a statue of St. Peter where his foot is almost completely worn yes. down because people walk in and everybody rubs the foot. Wow. Yes. So so it's like it's like you're here's a here's a statue of Lincoln. I'm gonna venerate it for a blessing, and then I'm gonna enter his tomb. Right. So and and again, a, a whole bunch of secularists. Oh, you're going to Lincoln and you're going to touch his nose for a blessing. Well, oh, I'm not gonna do that. Well, why are you gonna touch the nose? That's how we are. We're this way. Um, that I think it's says, mostly to understand, like you said, it's, right. it, we're not, we're neither criticizing nor celebrating this. We're just yeah. saying that this is how it works. Exactly. And this is actually how how any identity kind of holds together through these right. acts of celebrating and venerating and remembering the the those that that were that marked our history, marked our story, and right. also participate. And and so taking statues down. I mean, that's what this. We got to take those statues down. Are they idols? We can't help but participate in this. If if you didn't want to participate in it, you wouldn't care if there's a statue of Robert E. Lee in your in your town. You care because you participate in this, and our participation is in fact participating in the spirit of the nation just like participating in your high school was participating in school spirit and and you're a you're a spiritual actor in the creation of that school spirit and not all actors are alike the principal's got something but there might have been some there might have been some student at your school that broke some huge record or brought a team to the national championship in whatever sport or or died maybe drunk because of a drunk driver and a tree in your school was planted in the commons in memory of that student or 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 we all participate in these spirits we are spiritual beings and i know the hardcore secularists scoff at this but why am I doing this? Because without trying to cast doubt on the principalities and powers, I want us to have an appreciation for the spiritual qualities that we have and what we mean by this language. And so if I if I get around to dealing with the rise and fall of Mars Hill and demon hunting, well, this will be part of what we talk about because we're going to have an awfully difficult time conceptualizing what we mean by this word spirit if we don't understand that rubbing the nose of Abraham Lincoln or touching the the feet of St. Peter, St. Paul, I don't remember which one it was, probably St. Peter. It's a spiritual act. Just like being a cheerleader at the pep rally in your school spirit. That might be a really little tiny one, but it's in there. Participated in our unity. So, so this is just how it works. And so it can help Americans understand, like you said, why religious practices look the way they do, because they're, they're not just, they're more than religious in a strict sense. They're just the way that reality, reality lays itself out.
to quote my my friend Jonathan Pajot, it's not arbitrary. No, it's not um, arbitrary. <laughs> Uh, this idea like of having even the picture of the president in all official buildings like they I don't know if they right. still do it, but I know they did it. Uh, they did it before, you know, this kind of idea of having the image of the emperor, or the image of the king or the image, you know, in all these public spaces to mark. Go to a black church, not every black church, but most black churches walk in the front door bigger than life. Pastor, often the first lady's right there with him. The first you mean. You mean Mrs. Biden? No, the pastor's wife. She's the first lady. Don't you know anything about black churches? She's the first lady. His presence, and as you enter, you kind of see who the principality is that's at this moment holding all this together is something which is which is very religious in its uh, yeah. in, it, in the way in structure. I once I once organized a uh, an event at a Protestant, very like reformed. Baptist Protestant seminary. And uh, when you get there outside the building that we're in, they have this, this, this area called martyrs walk and you walk along and it's got the names of all of the, uh, you know, these different Baptist missionaries who have been killed doing overseas missions. But then you go inside and uh, you go inside and the, the main auditorium there is wall to wall with the pictures of each president and dean that the seminary has ever had in its you know history at calvin seminary i was a security guard for years at calvin college and seminary and there's all these old pictures up in the seminary of all old professors and some of them look pretty scary and i remember some of the security guards hated going through the seminary because it's like these pictures are looking at you and if you go into council rooms of how many christian reformed churches you see Pictures of the past ministers of the churches lined up in the council room. And, and of course, this is a tradition that says, no, we're all equal. Just some people have different spiritual gifts than others. There's no, there's no hierarchy here, but it's like you talk to any member of a Christian Reformed church and they'll say, oh, yeah, the pastor is... The pastor is supposed to be sort of the archetype of the church. They won't use that word archetype, but... And, and hence, in a black church, the first lady... And so it's, you, you walk in, you know, there's like names of the martyrs along the outside and you go in and the room is full of icons. I was, I was, I was with a, a, a friend. I wasn't Orthodox at the time, but I was with a friend who was. And uh, I, he and I just sort of looked at each other and grinned a little bit. And he said, and they say Protestants don't have icons. <laughs> um, anyway, and, and again, like, like my point is, I'm not trying to keep any kind of criticism on anyone about this. I'm just trying to say like, this is, this is the way that things cohere. This is the way that things hold together. Yeah. So with with that See, now, now part of the problem he, he has to use the word things and you know of course I talked to Verveke about hyper things and there's reasons why I'm using that but this is this is how we have community this is how we have a nation this is how we we participate together in a spirit and 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 this you know they're just right being said. Uh, the best way that we can understand the symbolism of Ethiopia, I think, is by reading the lives of the Ethiopian saints. Uh and then, you know, so the first 15 minutes is introduction, but that's the 15 minutes I wanted to play. And, of course, you can watch the rest of the video. And it's very, very interesting, these stories. But, you know, what I want us to have a sense of is, okay, what do we mean by these words? How does the world hold together? And maybe I'm just, you know, I spent a lot of time explaining what Jordan Peterson means. And I know it's a little pretentious to try to translate for these two, but then maybe it was obvious to all of you and I'm just slow at this, but they're right. They're right. And But this, this movement of stitching together you know, principality manifests in a person and we take it up into their legend or story or or biopic or something and then you know it's and then see and i think what happens part of the part of the process of modernity is it comes back and says did we get that right and and so what happens is that every generation does this and, and in some ways it's sort of a an anti-corruption technique but it's also a participation and appropriation technique. So, 
the musical Hamilton was an appropriation of American history for a new generation. And so the musical Hamilton is deeply Protestant in that sense. So, yeah. So there's my little commentary on this, and uh, let me know what you think.